Everyone knows the proof of work consensus with Bitcoin, but you saw a new way of doing it that would ultimately allow you to scale while we're waiting for potentially this proof of stake consensus to come in for E2.0, et cetera, but we're all still waiting. In the meantime, the single biggest complaint that I get in from my students in the DeFi Academy is gas, gas, gas. It actually stops them from even wanting to be involved with the protocol. They even say, Brian, I thought you told me DeFi was gonna change everything. This stops it from being changed. They're so frustrated. <laughs> Yeah, on the retail side, on the user side, that's that's uh, absolutely the number one complaint, which is um, as a, as a network gets popular, the fees start uh, going very, very high. The gas costs are very high. And suddenly the network becomes unusable for people like you and me. Uh, if you have a bot farm or you're a whale, then it's a different story. Then you can afford to interact and pay for $500 Uniswap fees. Uh, because you're doing uh, so, you know, you're doing trades on such bulk that that's uh, that that's reasonable. Um, that's one. There's another issue as well, Brian, that is uh, kind of overlooked. Um, if you look at it from the point of view of somebody who wants to digitize their assets, suppose you're an enterprise and you want to put your uh, whatever you've got on a blockchain. Um, well, you've got some concerns that other people don't have. You got to do it in a legal fashion. You got to be able to uh, predict what will happen in the future and build some controls to be able to accommodate changes in the future. Uh, you got to be able to respond to legislative changes. Things can change in a way that you did not even, even expect. You have to have full control over the full life cycle of whatever asset you've digitized. This was a number one requirement for us from enterprises. Another issue at the intersection of these two is suppose you're a company that wants to put IoT devices on a blockchain. Well, you want to shield yourself from other traffic so that people can, you know, for example, open their garage doors when it's time to interact with their garage door openers or whatever it is that you're putting on there. Uh, you want to be able to have performance isolation from the rest of the blockchain. So just because there's some ICO happening somewhere in the world doesn't mean that your IoT devices have to now pay very high fees or they will be unable to interact with the chain. So you got to be able to accommodate specific use cases in a fashion that is firewalled, isolated from other players on the network. So to that end, you need a couple of things. You need a very fast substrate. You need a very fast way to make decisions, a very fast way to achieve consensus on your network. That's one. And the second thing that Avalanche brings is a notion of subnets. You need a way to isolate unrelated use cases. You need to give people a way to shield themselves from other, other uh, projects online, or other projects that are sharing the same chain. That's exactly what Avalanche does. And uh, it does all of this with an eye towards one singular goal. And I haven't heard this goal enunciated by other people. I'm glad you said it at the top of the show. But let me say it again. Bitcoin is trying to be digital gold. It's trying to replace dollar, euros, etc. Um, Ethereum is trying to be some kind of a computer in the sky a global network computer. Those are fine use cases. That's not our use case. We're drastically different. My goal is to digitize all valuable things. My, my goal is to put everything on a blockchain. And to that end, uh, we designed the entire system to have the scale and uh, the structure uh, necessary for digitizing all things.